Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. Well, I really think, particularly with the, the new administration and, and frankly going through the economic times we're going through, it, this is a real step change uh, in terms of coming out of the recession, in terms of how most businesses are, are going to work. I think what worked before isn't going to work necessarily the same going forward, but I think it's pretty clear energy is at the forefront uh, in terms of some of our national priorities and, and global warming is as well. So. I think uh, you're not going to see very many coal plants being built going forward uh, for quite some time until maybe we have carbon capture and sequestration, but I do think it's going to be boom times for renewables. Uh, we are already uh, building an awful lot of wind generation today, but uh, I think you're going to see uh, a doubling, maybe even a tripling of uh, wind generation. That, that is uh, actually President Obama's goal is to triple the amount of insta the installed base of wind generation by 2012. That might be a little optimistic, but it's nice to hear him uh, wanting to do things like that when you're the largest developer of wind projects in the United States. But I also think you're going to see a lot more solar. The economics of solar have improved dramatically, and uh, I think solar is about where wind was 10 years ago, which not a whole lot of people were talking about wind energy 10 years ago, and, and now you know, it's a real business. I think solar is going to do the exact same thing. Now, we have uh, added to the portfolio some acquisitions, primarily existing nuclear power plants, but almost everything else in the portfolio we built, we built from scratch. And it really is a different culture, it's a different mindset of, of people, frankly, than the, sort of the traditional uh, people you would have found in a, any utility uh, 10, 20 years ago. And uh, uh, probably the closest thing I could use as an analogy would be you know, somebody who's a real estate developer or something like that. You've, you've got to have a vision and you've got to be out there uh, working, you know, pounding the pavement every single day and there's just a lot that goes you know, into it. It was a lot of investment in intellectual cap capital, if you will, for us. Uh, we, bought, we did buy a business a little over three years ago that uh, all they do is analyze wind data. They have a bunch of supercomputers, a bunch of other computers, uh, far more wind data than even the U.S. government. In fact, the U.S. government is a customer of ours, but it was a bunch of guys, PhDs in meteorology, PhDs in statistics. And that has given us a huge leg up in terms of our ability to uh, figure out where the wind resource was the best, the best places to put uh, wind farms and therefore the, you know, for our prospecting of land and for permitting and all of this takes a long time so it's not like all of a sudden President Obama comes in and says I want renewable energy and we're ready to go. This has been something we've been working on for more than a decade. I think we have the confluence right now of three things uh, going on. One is we have a an economy that's reeling and we need to put people back to work. Uh, that's clearly what the Obama administration was trying to do with the stimulus bill. But on top of that, we just came off of having $4 gasoline and we've got two wars going on and a lot of this is about, you know, oil. And, um, you know, people don't want to be paying $4 uh, for gas and I think people think that that's going to happen again as soon as the economy starts turning around. So you know you have that going on, and then coupled with that, you have global warming uh, and the concern about carbon dioxide getting in the atmosphere. We have to combat that. And actually, there's a fourth thing I hadn't thought of, which is uh, energy security, and I, that ties back to the war. But we really don't want to be so reliant on foreign countries, especially ones who may not like us so much, and be sending all these dollars over overseas to them. So. Uh, I think those forces all coming together are putting a lot more pressure on having a, a comprehensive energy policy, maybe for the first time in 20 or 30 years. And so I think that's what's really driving it. Now, of course, there's other technology issues in terms of what it's going to take to, to make all of this happen. But I think the, the forcing function is, are the four things I just talked about. 
I think in part, uh, clearly uh, what I got at Carnegie Mellon was um, a heavy dose of fact-based analysis and, and a lot of analytical rigor, and uh, I pride myself on that, and frankly, uh, I judge a lot of people who work for me on how rigorous they are and how analytical they are, and we've tried to set a culture of, uh, you know, being very factually uh, and analytically oriented. Uh, but I have to tell you, the part of that culture was there when I, I came to the company. I've only been at uh, FPL Group for not quite 10 years now, and uh, a lot of goes back to uh, FPL was the first company outside of Japan to win the Deming Award for quality back in, I think it was 1989, a long time ago. Um, some of the quality efforts, I would admit to you, were a little misguided, but the real benefit of that is so many of the employees had been trained in basic statistical methods, and uh, there was a culture of you know, trying to look elsewhere to figure out you know, who was doing something best, so a benchmarking type culture. And, uh, some of that had waned in the you know, in intervening years, but we resurrected uh, that early on when I was named CEO and uh, you know, really tried to step it up a, a notch or two with some of the Six Sigma tools, Lean tools, and we've done a lot of other things to really have the whole culture embrace uh, the notion of continuous improvement and benchmarking and uh, you know, best practices. People are amazed when they see what we do for wellness, and it's not the typical things that I think a lot of other companies do, although we do most of that, but for instance, we have gyms at every one of our facilities, and they're not just you know, a few pieces of equipment. These are beautiful, you know, world-class you know, gyms in terms of the, the, the condition of the equipment, the type of equipment, the trainers that we have there, and the only thing our employees have to bring is their tennis shoes. We provide everything else. We do their laundry. We take away every excuse for not working out as just one example. We run nutritional programs all the time. Uh, we subsidize in our cafeterias healthy food. So now if somebody wants to have a hot dog or a cheeseburger, they can still have it, but they're going to pay full, full price for that. If they want to have a healthy meal, they're getting a, a really good bargain for it. Um, and we have spin classes, and we have classes on healthy backs and smoking cessation, and, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, but it's all about uh, you know, keeping our employees healthy and productive, and, and I really think they're happier. And uh, we did something just a few years ago. We put health clinics in our, we, we haven't been able to do those in every center. So now you can go get basically, you can see a doctor, you can see a nurse practitioner, you can get basic x-rays, you can get uh, physical therapy, uh, dermatology services, all of these things. We find our, our employees are much happier. Have, we provide the service at a lower cost and our employees don't have to go off you know, on their lunch hour or some other time, go travel. Even if it's 10 or 15 minutes each way, that's a lot of time, and then they're waiting in a waiting room and so on and so forth. And uh, we make sure that the, the care we provide in those centers is, uh, is absolutely top quality. And uh, we started just offering it to our employees. Then the employees wanted their families to be able to do it, and so now we have the families coming. Uh, so it's another thing that we were, we were doing it for bottom line purposes, say, you know, employee productivity, saving health care costs, but it's become a, a real benefit for our employees. A few things uh, do come to mind. Uh, one is make sure you're doing something you like, and you've probably heard that a million times, but I see a lot of people, you know, just work is drudgery to them, and, you know, they're just doing the wrong thing, and it's the proverbial life's too short. So I, I really would start uh, with, with that as, uh, as advice. Uh, another one, when I see people who I think are successful CEOs, and I know at least what's worked for me, is, uh, you know, it really takes total immersion in a business, and, uh, you know, there has to be some sacrifices, and, uh, and you know, beyond that, it's, uh, you know, it, it really is a lot of the basics. I am a big believer in, as we talked earlier, fact-based analysis, uh, you know, really having, you know, your act together, if you will, and, and knowing the facts. And, uh, you know, the other thing I would say is encourage people to challenge your thinking. You know, don't just try to be necessarily right all the time. Don't surround yourself with yes people. Uh, I tell people, constantly, and it's part of my messaging to folks, is uh, we, we want people to challenge one another, we want them to do it in the right way, 
far better to be embarrassed in a little conference room where somebody tells you your idea is wrong and here's why, here's the three reasons why, whatever, than to go and make some big investment. In our industry, the stakes are big. Most of our investments are start at a half a billion dollars or more. And then you're going to live with that mistake for 30 or 40 years.